always get a lot of questions as to how I came up with my name, and as it turns out, it comes from a series of games that I enjoyed playing as a kid, those being Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2. As you can see, I actually picked both of these up secondhand about 10 years ago from my think a half price books. And as it turns out, a new game has come out that's kind of like a spiritual successor to those games called Pillars of Eternity. The game was developed because of Kickstarter donations. Obsidian Entertainment wanted to go back to their roots and have 100% creative control over a product, so they crowdfunded Pillars of Eternity. And in many ways, this could be one of the most successful Kickstarters I've ever seen. With a fresh coat of paint and new engine, this game takes the concepts presented in those older games and streamlines and updates them with new mechanics. If you're used to playing Boulder's Gate or Icewind Dale, you'll sometimes not be able to shake that feeling of deja vu. Occasionally, this game will literally just copy and paste an older game's ideas, specifically Boulder's Gate. But they had to change some things as to not be a part of the official Dungeons and Dragons universe. So things like spell names, even though remarkably similar to those older game spells, will have different names. Even so, you can easily tell that most of the game's functionality and mechanics are taken directly from Boulder's Gate or Icewind Dale. So if you're used to those games, you will know exactly how this game plays. And that doesn't mean that they didn't add more where necessary and make a potentially better version of those classic games. So as Boulder's Gate is one of my favorite video game series, how is Pillars of Eternity? Let's find out. You begin the game by creating a character from a variety of races and classes, most of which play similarly to any of the older D&D classic games. Alright, now I can roleplay as Jake Sully! They'll never know I'm here. You could also be someone who kinda looks like the Mouth of Sauron with like a dark mist or something. There are a few unique class ideas, mainly the chanter who continually sings verses that buff your party, and then you can unleash spells after a few chants have occurred. And then there are cyphers who are more of a soul-oriented class which speaks to more of the story of the game. Every class that you pick has a pile of stats and numbers behind everything, and if you don't know what you're doing, the game tries its best to inform you of what's going on. Which, unfortunately, unless I wasn't paying attention, sometimes they forget to tell you about certain things. If you're not used to a heavy pen and paper dice rolling based system, then you're gonna be pretty overwhelmed. Luckily, the game tells you which stats are most important for your class, and it would be best to follow the guidelines put in place by the game so that whatever you choose performs well in combat and other activities. Believe me, this isn't the type of game where you can be the best at everything. You have to focus your characters on specific things. This game has a lot of things going on. It's a pretty intricate game that might not be for everyone. But if you get used to all the systems and mechanics put in place, you'll likely not find a better role-playing game this year. The story begins with whoever you make being a part of a traveling caravan heading to a new land, mainly for colonization looking to build a new life. But uh-oh, it looks like the path is blocked and I'm coming down with the case of the sniffles. <coughs> Sick, I can't work. <laughs> Suckers. Uh-oh, again, it looks like everyone was massacred. And it just so happened to take place while I was it. off picking berries for a sickness that I'm not sure I even had yet. But it's okay, it's okay, don't worry. I'm a wizard. Oh no, a storm! Oh man, epic music's playing. This definitely isn't looking good, guys. Oh no, Jake's so no. After all that madness, you're then thrust into a cave. In this place, you'll learn how the game works and get a little bit of gear for your character. Those tiles look suspicious. Oh really, do they? Do they look suspicious? They're freaking glowing! Of course they look suspicious! Eventually you'll end up back outside where a strange device and a weird ceremony are taking place. The strange device activates and seems to take you to another plane of existence. This device and the ritual in combination with the weird storm seem to have given you weird powers which in this game is referred to as being a watcher. Someone who can peer into the soul of a host and see scenes from current or past lives. You don't really have much control over what happens or what's shown to you, but nonetheless they play a pretty important role throughout the game. For example, you come across this guy named Naunton. He seems like a pretty alright guy, you know, a straight shooter. He tells you about this cave to the north that supposedly has a bear in it, and I totally didn't go to that earlier and die. Also, I forgot to mention that his friend died there and he's really sad about it, but he doesn't want you to go to the cave. So I went to yes. the cave! And after taking revenge on the bear and speaking to the lingering soul, who just so happens to be that guy's friend, he alludes to the fact that he was indeed murdered, or at least betrayed to the point where the bear could finish him off. And oh my god! He lied to me. So now you have some interesting decisions to make. Do you hunt him down and confront him about this? Or do you just let it be? It's stuff like this that puts a really engaging and interesting spin on a lot of the ways the quest can unfold due to having your character be a watcher. I like it. After 
after all the tutorials and the story is set up, you're then thrust into the new and chaotic world of Aeora. The kingdom you've migrated to isn't exactly in the best of times. There's a weird disease that leaves newborn children soulless and hollow. Bandits taking advantage of the situation, and a king who is enforcing cruel and punishing commands in his attempts to figure out the madness of his predicament. It's up to you to investigate and solve the situations at hand in whatever manner you wish. But I don't want to talk about the story too much because the game is so heavily story-based that I don't want to spoil too much of what's going on for you guys. But I will say that... This game is definitely a story-driven game, and it begs you to get invested in its world and learn everything you could possibly learn about it. In fact, the game can sometimes be so verbose that you can find yourself skimming through a lot of the dialogue or backstories, which in some cases can be your downfall, as you might not understand completely what's going on or grasp some deceivingly difficult puzzles the game has to offer. In 2602 AI, Um, is this gonna be on the test? The game is also incredibly complex and hard. Even on the normal difficulty without proper planning and execution, you will definitely die. Luckily, this is where party management is going to come into play. You could have up to five other characters join your party for a total of six characters. Some of these characters can be story characters that Obsidian themselves created, but what's really engaging is the fact that you can pretty much, at any time you want, hire an adventurer from the tavern. And doing this lets you create another custom character from scratch to take along with you on your adventures. And trust me, you'll definitely want to be using this feature to round out some of the missing character classes from your party. As I said before, each character class isn't really a jack-of-all-trades character. They're all really specialized, so it's really great that they added this feature into the game so that you're not necessarily lacking in any specific area or completely locked out of a piece of content the game has to offer. Now let's talk about the graphics. They're good. Now let's talk about the combat. Well, it's good too, but it might not be something you're used to seeing. Everything is super tactical. It can sometimes feel like you're playing a huge game of chess against the AI. Or yourself. I mean, this is pretty much how most encounters will play out. Oh man, I gotta send my tank to the front lines. Pause. Okay, I'm gonna do a super mega fire- Wait a second, well, maybe I'll do this spell instead. No, fireball, maybe- Okay, fireball. Bang. It can also be incredibly overwhelming as you have so many different actions and spells you can use, it's hard to know what you should be doing and when. But once you learn all of it and start messing around and learning all the different spell mechanics and adapt some strategies, you'll start flying through some of the encounters with ease. What makes it even better is that the game incorporates its own fast and slow modes so that you have a little bit of manual control over the pacing. Because let's face it, this is a game where you have to pause. A lot. Anytime you go into an encounter, the game is automatically set to pause so that you can tactically move your characters around and prepare them for combat. And if you don't pause the game, then you're likely going to regret it because you're going to be dead. Luckily, or perhaps unluckily, depending on how you do in the game, there are some new systems in place that keep you going for longer. In the older Boulder's Gate games, you would have to rest quite a bit because all of your spells would need to be reset and all of your health restored. Now when you rest, not only will you get a full heal on your characters and reset your more powerful spells, but your characters have a per-encounter skill that they can take advantage of. My wizard here can cast a little AoE bolt twice per battle, and it's... Epic. Also, your characters work on a really interesting new endurance system, which adds another level of depth to the combat. Now, your characters don't necessarily die when they get knocked out. They have both health and endurance, and if their endurance goes down to zero, they fall over. They're also really vulnerable in this state, and if their health reaches zero, they can actually die. And yes, if the enemy's move is strong enough to kill you or your companions, there is permanent death, so you'll often be quick saving and quick loading so you don't totally screw up. Without spoiling too much, there's two really cool and important mechanics this game has to offer. One being that you eventually get a stronghold that you have to manage. There's tons of upgrades for your stronghold, but you have to be careful because making your stronghold better increases its prestige, making it more desirable for people to stay at, but also attracting the attentions of unwanted people planning to attack or rob you. So you have to balance your upgrading by hiring defenders and building defensive upgrades so that you can begin rebuilding the stronghold from the ground up. It's a really fun system, and I'd probably say I enjoy it more than recent games with a similar system like Dragon Age Inquisition. The other cool feature this game has to offer is a dungeon called the Endless Paths of Odd Nua, which is essentially a mega dungeon that will definitely challenge you. At any point after you've unlocked the stronghold, you can go back to it and have access to this dungeon, as it's underneath the stronghold. So you can build varying parties and test yourself in one of the game's harder and punishing dungeons. 
And for as much as I kid around with the game, I truly think it's one of the better role-playing games to come out in a really long time. And in my opinion, it soars even greater than games like Dragon Age Inquisition because it doesn't seem to have all these conflicting ideas that work against each other. This game knew exactly what it wanted to be the moment they started development on it, and it really shows. I definitely welcome it as a spiritual successor to the Boulder's Gate franchise, and I can't wait for more. And now I must go. My people need me. You must gather your party before venturing forth. You must gather your party before venturing forth. You must gather your party before venturing forth. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching my video, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you want some more videos like these, you can always click that subscribe button, and if you like the video, why not click like? If you want to stay up to date on everything related to the channel, then you can go ahead and follow me on my social networks, links down in the description. I also want to take this moment to thank some of my Patreon supporters, so special thanks to Harry Gaynor, Juan Holguin, Taylor Van Gilder, and Lars. If you're interested in watching some more videos, I got two videos for you right there. Monster Rancher 2 and the Top 10 Silliest Guns in Video Games. And as always, thank you guys so much for all the support, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.